Hello everyone and welcome to Rock Your Block. I'm James Jack, your host, and I am honored to have as my guest, noted author, <laughs> Leonard S. Greenberger. He wrote this beautiful book. It's entitled, What to Say When Things Get Tough. It's a really, really good book. I wish I had had it in the third grade, probably the fifth <laughs> grade, the tenth grade. And if I had, I'd probably have gotten a bit farther in life, especially dealing with people, than I have. But that being said, fortunately, I have Mr. Greenberger here to tell me why people like me need a book like this in their repertoire, in their library, in their glove box to read every once in a while and, run, and remind themselves of, uh, of, of what it takes to, to win over another person. So. I want to thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having me. Now, first off, who are you, what are you about, and we'll start from there. Okay. Well, I have been a professional communications consultant for more than 20 years now, and during that time I've worked with dozens of senior officials at corporations and trade associations and government agencies to help them communicate in tough situations. And as I've honed the strategies, skills, and techniques that I have taught these senior executives, uh, I have realized that really anyone, any business professional, is going to face a tough situation from time to time. And the communication strategies, skills, and techniques I talk about in the book can come in handy when people are concerned about what you're doing and they're angry and worried and suspicious of everything you say. So instead of having that loose lip that will sink your ship, you're going to teach them how to stay afloat and navigate themselves through those tortuous or... That's you know. a, a very good way to put it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about what people say. In fact, it's more about what you do and your nonverbal messages than your verbal messages. Okay. Now, why should I have read this book and why should I tell someone else that they should read it after they've bought it? Well, as I said, any business professional, and really anyone, is going to find themselves in a tough situation from time to time when they need to communicate effectively with one person or several who are wor angry, worried, and suspicious of everything they say. It could be your boss. It could be employees. It could be your family, maybe your spouse. Or if your organization finds itself in the middle of a crisis, you could need to communicate in a tough situation with reporters or even government officials. So give me an example of how someone may have made a mistake, realized it, or someone they work with realized that a mistake was made and they had to quickly stop the bleeding. If you want to, you know. Well, let me give you an example from my own professional life okay. uh, in having to deal with an employee. Um, my firm has been in business for 32 years and we've been very fortunate that only on a handful of occasions have we had to let an employee go for poor performance. We had to do that a few years ago with a young man who just wasn't working out. My partner and I sat him down to tell him the news. And once we told him that we were going to have to let him go, my partner immediately told him a story to help the situation go a little bit better than it might have otherwise. And what he told him was that this happened to me about the same time in my career when I was young like you. I took a job that wasn't really a very good fit. Uh, I didn't put my all into it, and eventually they came to me and said, we're going to have to let you go. And let me tell you something, he said to this young man, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because I went on and started a new career, and now here I am a partner at our PR firm. It took a very tough situation where that employee was very definitely worried and suspicious of what we were telling him and made the conversation much easier. He took it much better. You could see it in his body language when my partner expressed some caring and empathy and used some of the skills and techniques we talk about in the book, it made that conversation go so much better than it otherwise would have. Skills is a word that you use a lot. Mm -hmm. So tell me basically how you have developed that skill and how it's a part of your everyday life and how do you implement it immediately, immediately after you and your, your associates come up with a plan. Well. Let me back up a little bit and talk about the different situations that you'll find yourself in and why these strategy skills and techniques come into play. In normal situations, a situation like this for example, I have a certain amount of trust and credibility with you, I hope. I wrote this book, 
I have 20 years of experience as a professional communicator. McGraw-Hill saw fit to publish it, so they must think that there's, I have something worthwhile to say. So I walked into this situation with a certain amount of trust and credibility. And that's typically what we find in the workplace, for example. When you're dealing with your colleagues, or you're dealing with customers, or you're dealing with your boss, for the most part, it's a normal situation. The trust and credibility exists. And you don't have to really work very hard to earn that trust and credibility or to maintain it. What we're talking about here is a very different situation, where you walk into a situation where you don't have any trust and credibility with the audience that you're trying to win over and persuade, inform, or educate about something. And so the skills that I talk about are the skills you need to earn that trust and credibility so that you can be successful in getting them to change their mind about something or take some action that you want them to take or just believe what you have to say. When I was a little boy, I always wanted to play baseball. And um, I wanted to be a pitcher, as most boys do want to be, unless they're, of course, put on track to become a catcher. Right. And I, I played could, third place, not very well. Yeah. I didn't pitch very well at all. In fact, every time they showed me the rudiments, I went completely in another direction. It made the coaches mad. It made the other players mad. And I had to suck it up and play shortstop. Mm. I enjoyed playing shortstop and second base, but I always wanted in the back of my mind to play, you know, to, to pitch, you know didn't matter to me. So without the proper guidance, there was no one there to say, I can take this kid and teach him how to pitch. So that's what you do. You teach people who are in the corporate arena how right. to pitch the ball and strike out or help your, your side to win. That's right. That, that, that is a good way of describing uh, what we do. And the strategies, uh, skills, and techniques, and I know I'm saying that many times, uh, that come into play to make that work well uh, are what I cover in the book. You're not going to find in the book very much theory. Uh, I talk a, lot, a little bit about it in the beginning. The book is a very practical, hands-on uh, primer for people uh, that provides a lot of case studies and examples of work that I've done and my colleagues have done for our clients. And practical advice on the things you need to do to win people over when they're angry, worried, and suspicious of everything you say. Okay, I've decided I want to run for city council member of my in my, my, my little town. Mm -hmm. And um, a few years ago, I made a, a big mistake. I called somebody, you know, a name that I should not have called them. Not a really bad name, but just enough to rub them the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that they've forgotten. However, there are a couple of other people who remembered it, and now they know that I'm running for public office. So I hire your company to come in, and uh, you guys are going to make it right. What do you tell me? Well, I think the first thing that we would tell you is there's a lot of power in an apology. I don't think a lot of public officials and corporate officials really understand that that's true. And that goes to a very important point that I make in the book, and I'm glad you brought it up. Now, let me step back here a little bit and talk a, a little bit of theory. As I said, not very much. But about 40 years ago, a professor at UCLA named Albert Marabanian did some seminal work looking at how we decide whether or not we like somebody or trust them and find them credible. And what he discovered was that they're primarily the way we judge people is not by what they say, but by what they look like and how they their facial expressions and their mannerisms. First impressions. First impressions, that's exactly right. And to determine whether or not, based on that work, other experts then decided, OK, what do people need to do in order to establish the trust and credibility that they need to communicate effectively in any situation, whether it's a normal situation like this one, where we already have trust and credibility, or it's a tough situation where we don't and we need to get it before we'll be, we will be able to convince anybody to do anything. And one of the real leaders in the field and one of my early mentors, Vincent Cavello, developed what he calls the credibility pie. And it looks at four factors that everybody uses to decide whether or not they think someone is trustworthy and credible. Pie? Pie. OK. Credibility pie, Okay. Like, like an apple pie. <laughs> and we took that pie and turned it into a code. Because the code stands for caring and empathy. That's the C. The O is for openness and honesty. The D is for dedication and commitment, and the E is for expertise and competence. 
And it turns out that of those four factors, the most important one by far is caring and empathy. Mm -hmm. If you, people will believe you are trustworthy and credible if they think you are caring and empathetic. And that gets back to why the apology is so important. So if you're a politician who's going to run for office and you've made a mistake in the past, it's very important to acknowledge that mistake, express caring and empathy for whatever damage you did or insult you might have made, and then move on. That's going to take you a long way towards being able to reestablish that trust and credibility that you need to be successful. One thing about it, if you're going to run for public office or if you, if you want to be head of a corporation or whatever, someone's going to dig deep enough to find out that one little nugget about you that will either put you over the top or will bring you down. So as you said, it's always a good idea, number one, to go back and take a look inside your closets, inside your whatever's, your, the recesses of your mind, mm -hmm. and just come to grips with the fact that this is something that could come back to haunt you. Um, one of the things that I remember during the Obama uh, campaign was he gave a lady enough money to buy a ticket so she could get back to Europe or something. And when she saw him on television running for public office, she says, that's the guy that gave me the money. And I'm not sure whether or not he at that time was having credibility issues, mm -hmm. but that one bit of charity helped him to win over a significant number of people and this was something that he probably had forgotten about or didn't even mention to his staff that they could have used themselves. So that, that really works well. It does. I want to just emphasize the point that we're talking about President Obama and mm -hmm. corporate leaders and certainly they are terrific examples and people that you can watch to see how they employ the strategy skills and techniques in the book both for doing it well and maybe not doing it so well. Uh, but again, the book is really for anybody because we're all going to find ourselves in a tough situation at some point where we need to win people over who are angry, worried, and suspicious. And just as it applies for somebody in a position like President Obama, it applies for just about anybody. And in our discussion earlier, I was telling you that I thought that this was something that would really reach a lot of different people, uh, teachers, administrators, you know, people who really have not t touched the, that one mind that just needs a little bit of encouragement, but that you've got to get that, you've got to win that trust over. And when we come back after this little break, I want you to talk about how you break through to reach those people. The book is entitled, What to Say When Things Get Tough. My guest is Leonard S. Greenberger. He is the writer, the author, I should say, and he's also a public relations pro. He knows what he's talking about, and this is a book that I think that you should read. I'm James Jack, and this is Rock Your Block. We'll be right back. To order a DVD or VHS copy of this program or any program seen on Channel 10, call 571-749-1101. Welcome back to Rock Your Block. I'm James Jack, your host, and my guest today is Mr. Leonard S. Greenberger. He's the author of this book, What to Say When Things Get Tough. Now, that sounds simple, but each of us has been very close to, if not in a panic, when we knew we put our foot in it. However, sometimes we can usually just take our foot out of it and things are all right. But sometimes it leaves a scar and a blemish, not only within our own minds and our hearts, but in the minds and hearts of other people. And Mr. Greenberger, Leonard, uh, has been explaining how this not only works or what he teaches works for uh, the, the people in uh, corporate America, the higher-ups, the politicians, other celebrities and artists, but how it can work for the everyday Joe. That's right. And uh, any business professional or really anyone, because even outside of an office environment, we're going to find ourselves in tough situations. Uh, we may have difficulty with a family member or a spouse, for example, or just somebody that we come across in our day-to-day -day lives. So the strategy, skills, and techniques apply in any tough situation. So you go beyond Vincent Peale. That's right. In terms of how to win friends and influence. You, right. you actually go deeper in terms of how to actually touch that person. That's right. We do. Let me explain a little bit about, I get a question all the time from people that I work with, how do I know if I'm in a tough situation? How do I know if people are angry, worried, and suspicious? How do I know, as we talked earlier, whether I have trust and credibility with this audience? 
Now, there are two reasons that people become angry, worried, and suspicious, at least for the purposes of, of the book and what I write about. One is that they're concerned about something. And they're concerned because they believe that they are impo that you are imposing some sort of a risk on them. Yes. Uh, it could be a physical risk. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps they're worried that something you're doing might put themselves in harm's way or somebody that they care about in harm's way. A good example that I use in the book is the siting of a landfill, controversial facility. If somebody comes to your community and tells you we're going to build a landfill here, they may worry that there's going to be a more truck traffic, which could be dangerous on the roads. They don't know what's going to go into the landfill. Is the stuff they're going to be dang dangerous or harmful to my family in some way. So that's a physical risk. It can be an emotional risk, which means just some sort of stress or burden that you're placing on people. Think about the landfill. In addition to the truck, tra truck traffic perhaps being dangerous, it's also noisy. Uh, there are a lot of odors that come off of the landfill. These aren't things that are necessarily going to hurt them physically, but you're adding to their anxiety. Or it can be a financial risk. And we'll stick with the landfill example. A lot of the clients that I work with cite controversial facilities like that. And one of the top concerns that we hear from people in the community is, what's going to happen to my property value if you build that here? Am I going to lose money? So in other so, words, it's now in their backyard. That's right. Or will be in their backyard. And we know how difficult that can be today to build anything anywhere. So one of the reasons that they are angry, worried, and suspicious is because they're concerned about something. And the other, as we've discussed already, is that they do not trust you as a source of information. And they may not trust you because they feel that you've harmed them in some way before, or perhaps they think you have a vested interest in the outcome, and so you don't really care about what they're worried about. So those are the two things. When you find yourself in what is known as a high concern, low trust situation, then the strategy, skills, and techniques in this book come into play and you need to employ them. You can use them in a normal situation like this, too. It's not going to hurt you, but you absolutely have to use them. Well, before we break through and win their trust, I remember reading uh, a couple of passages where uh, you said that times have changed. And there was a time when people just ex you know, they accepted anything that the politician told them or that the clergy or anyone, because uh, these things were not to be questioned. We were taught to just shut up and accept it, accept, you know, right. don't rock the boat. But around the, uh, the, the, the beginning of the 80s, actually the late 60s and then That's uh, right. evolving into the 80s, people began to say, well, I have a voice. So now it's not as easy to just steamroll people or communities or you know, individuals uh, into your way of thinking because they're just going to accept it. So here we are now, we're talking to that's the right. individual. That works also for that student that's sitting there too? Um, sure, absolutely. And what you're referring to is uh, that in the late 60s and early 70s, time of great upheaval, the civil rights movement, the environmental movement, as these things became more pronounced and people began to uh, take on more power in terms of what was happening to them and happening in their communities, they started to fight back, and that's where the not in my backyard began to really grow. Mm -hmm. And at the same time that was happening, uh, corporations, government agencies realized that it was no longer enough just to ignore what people thought about what they were doing and have them accept it without questioning it. Now they had to employ a new set of skills to convince them and engage with them so that they would be more accepting of what governments or corporations were trying to do. That gave rise to the strategy, skills, and techniques that I talk about in the book. So just like computer chips and social networks and things like this, this is really a social science that has evolved or a form of communications or uh, um, uh, an ology itself that has evolved. So we're really in the infancy of it now. Would you say? Uh, I would say maybe not. Maybe the teenage years, not the, <laughs> not, not the <laughs> puberty. Really? Maybe yeah. maybe a little beyond. Yeah, the the skills were really, really developed beginning with research in the late 60s and mm -hmm. early 70s. I mentioned Vincent Cavello and Albert Marabanian were two of the real gurus that started the the science that underpins all of the things that we're talking about here today. So we have gotten to a point now where most people have accepted that times are different, and you can't just do things anymore, mm -hmm. or simply explain what you're doing and expect people to accept it, again, you have to engage them. You have to get out into the community and talk to them about what you're doing. Let me give you an example from okay. our own work. As I said, we work with a lot of clients that cite controversial, facili controversial facilities. And we were working for a utility a few years ago that wanted to build a new 
high voltage power line, one of those big lines with the big towers. And as you can imagine, those are pretty controversial when you walk into a community and say, hey, we're going to put this line in, in your backyard. Now, back in the 1950s, had they wanted to build that line, they would have convinced the regulators that they needed the line. The regulators would have said yes, and they would have gone and built it. They never would have even engaged or talked to anybody in the communities, and the communities just would have accepted it without question. Very different today. Now that client, that utility, had to spend as much time and effort convincing regulators that the line was necessary as they did engaging with the communities where that line was going to be to get them to accept that it was coming in. We helped organize dozens of meetings and communities all along this very long transmission line to help educate people about what was happening, to hear their concerns, to deal with them, to listen, and to incorporate their feedback into the plans. I'm pleased to say that it was very successful. It turns out that the line was not built because the recession came and electricity demand went down, so it wasn't necessary anymore. But I'd like to think that the work that we did will help when eventually and demand comes back and that line needs to be built. So when you're working with a, a client such as that, mm -hmm. do you round up the usual suspects? Um, do you have sort of like a, do you know, do you scout, do you find out who are these people, these opinion makers that we should go to first before we go to the masses or before we go to the community and have a, a town hall meeting? Uh, are there people who are on your radar that you just sort of know, not necessarily in your camp or who feel the way that you feel, do you know right. that you've got to reach those people first? Well, I think it's, a, it's reaching out to everybody, really. But what you're getting at here is one of the equations in the book that's really key to the strategy skills Which and techniques that, that we talk about. Which one would that be? The equation would be 3P equals HC, which stands for third parties equal higher credibility. Correct. I talked about the fact that in a tough situation, you don't have a lot of trust and credibility when you walk onto the stage, if you will. One thing you can do to enhance your own credibility is to borrow some from somebody who has more than you do. And that's a third party, often an academic, a professor, uh, a doctor, local doctors, local officials can also be very credible sources of information. So you work with them to get the information that you want to get. I, I was tickled when you said that uh, sometimes credibility rises and falls, so you have to be careful about who you're reaching out to. Uh, you have to make sure that that person's on the rise or at a point where you know their credibility is impeccable at that time because if you reach out for someone who is on the downswing or who is, whose credibility is not as high as it should be it can hurt you as much that's so right. I, I think that's great now we get to the part that I really like as <laughs> the song goes um, okay I'll mention his name David a Axelrod right. Would you tell the story about David Axrod? Sure, sure. And how it touched. So you're talking about storytelling, and that's a very important part of winning people over when they're angry, worried, and suspicious of everything you say. Because as I mentioned earlier, you need to be a caring and empathetic person, and the best way to do that is to tell stories that people can relate to. David Axelrod is a former advisor to President Obama, very well known, appears on the talk sh Sunday morning talk shows all the time. And I watched those pretty regularly. And I had gotten to the point where I wasn't listening to David Axelrod anymore because he was just speaking in talking points and messages. And that's the kind of world we live in today. You are not alone. We, we, we're part of the problem. We counsel clients to do that too. But we've gone beyond that because we realize that that's really not enough anymore. You need to tell good stories. David Axelrod was on TV. I was doing the dishes, I think. And I heard him in the background. He was talking about President Obama's health care plan. And he started to tell a story about his daughter who suffered from um, autism, not autism, autism, epilepsy. Epilepsy. And he was saying how when he and his wife were a young couple with their young daughter living in Chicago before he had made it, he used to lie awake at night worrying whether or not they were going to be able to afford their daughter's health care expenses because there was a lifetime cap on the amount of money that his insurance company would pay. And his daughter was going to need lifetime care. And he explained that one of the features of the Affordable Care Act was to eliminate lifetime caps. Now, not only did I pay very close attention to this story because it was engaging, he also helped convince me that the health care law was a good idea. He went on the show to influence me, and he succeeded. And now I pay more attention to David Axelrod. When he so he television. broke through. He broke through, and he won me over. An aha moment? Very much so. So your own teachings had come back to teach you. Right. I realized, Boomerang. Hey, that's exactly right. Hey, this <laughs> stuff works. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, uh, in storytelling. 
Um, I think that uh, it's an art that uh, for a while sort of died off, mm -hmm. but all the, 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 the great masters, uh, the, the, the uh, Franklin Roosevelt, right. uh, Martin, Mark Luther Twain, King, Martin Luther King, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan all, great, yeah, story all great storytellers. And if you listen very closely, there's a, there's a method to their madness, and the resolution is always that of, this makes sense, doesn't it? That's right. And let me make a quick point about mm -hmm. those great communicators. They weren't always great. They had to hone their skills over time uh, before they became famous and well-known and successful because, in part, they were such great storytellers. And that's a very important message I want to drive home to people who buy my book, and that is this is a beginning. Uh, same thing I tell people that I train. When you're done reading the book, you're going to be, you're going to have a good head start on being able to win people over in tough situations. But you're going to have to practice and prepare and rehearse in order to be successful. That's the only way you can get to Carnegie Hall. That's right. You have to practice. It's a performance. First read and then practice, practice, practice. My guest today, quite an honor, Mr. Thank you. Leonard S. Greenberger. He works for a PR firm here in the Washington, D.C. area. I'll give it a plug. Atomic Communications. Thank you. And he wrote this book entitled, What to Say When Things Get Tough. Buy it, read it, and then encourage someone else to read it. Break through to them too. I'm James Jack, and I hope you've enjoyed this edition of Rock Your Block and Homes Radio. And until I see you again, have fun doing what you're doing because that's what you like to do. Bye. <laughs>